Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, awesome. Did you guys all have, uh, ooh, you have a, a good time at the, the party, the concert yesterday? Awesome. Yeah, it looks, some people, looks like some people didn't wake up this morning. So, uh, all right. We appreciate you guys' dedication. So thank you. Um, hello again and good morning. Uh, my name is Roy Hassan. I'm a senior business development manager for um, analytics and data lakes at AWS. Um, I'm joined here by uh, Zuzana. She's an engineering manager at Autodesk. Uh, so today, uh, basically what we'll do, we'll discuss um, how Autodesk used data extracted from Salesforce uh, to do predictive analytics on AWS. Actually, make sure I use the right one. All right, so you're, you're, probably, <laughs> you know, you're probably saying that concert last night was a blast, and uh, what am I doing here this early in the morning, right? Um, so let me tell you. Uh, Aberdeen conducted a, a survey that, that showed companies who were able to analyze uh, and act on data quickly uh, and efficiently outperformed those companies who couldn't, right? So to gain an advantage, uh, leading companies uh, started by building out data lakes on AWS. A data lake, if you don't know what it is, uh, it's basically an approach to collect and store all the data uh, at low cost, collaborate, uh, iterate, and also act on that insight very, very quickly to generate business value and improve customer experience. So data lakes. Hopefully you like the, the little picture over there. But uh, data lakes really uh, allows you to collect and store data in one centralized repository in the original form of that data, right? So you can ingest any type of data without um, really converting it to any kind of predefined schema. So what that really means is that you no longer need to know what questions you want to ask of your data beforehand. So it's really powerful. Uh, so with unmatched durability, availability, scalability, and security, and a much broader set of features and integrations with partners like Salesforce um, you know, than really anywhere else, Amazon S3 is a clear choice for your data lake. Amazon S3 also allows customers to leverage a broad set of analytics and machine learning services available on AWS uh, to get you uh, to insight quicker. So AWS Glue uh, is a core component of a successful data lake implementation. Uh, AWS Glue really enables you to do three main things. The first one is automatically discover and catalog your data in your data lake. Right, it's uh, to really help you find and explore that data. Automatically, the second one is automatically generate uh, robust code uh, to be able to enrich and transform your data, increasing its value and usability. Right? Having a, the same data over and over again is not really useful. Can you really enrich it and make it more usable for more teams? And then lastly, um, automatic, uh, uh, do all this kind of stuff, everything that we're talking about here, in a fully managed serverless environment with really minimal operational overhead. So get you started quickly and easily. Amazon Athena is another service that, that we'll talk about, but really what it is is an interactive query service that makes it really easy for you to analyze data on S3 using standard SQL. As we just discussed, and you'll see soon in uh, Zuzana's uh, presentation, uh, S3 serves as our data lake. So having a simple to use um, serverless option to quickly analyze data in your data lake makes it really easy to get started. So what you see here is the, the Amazon uh, machine learning stack. So Amazon has been doing machine learning for over 20 years. You're probably very well familiar with the product recommendations we have on Amazon.com, right? You may also heard, you know, know of Alexa, right? So voice-driven interaction using Alexa. And also the, the more recent announcements or, or release of the, the cashierless um, Amazon Go stores, right? They're all using machine learnings, things that we've built in-house. So, we really built uh, the broadest selection of tools to help customers in every stage of their machine learning journey. Um, if you look down at, at the slide, hopefully you can see it okay. Uh, at the, the very foundation, uh, we provide the most robust set of uh, low-level machine learning tools and, and, um, and frameworks uh, in an Amazon machine image, right? On top of really high-powered infrastructure, so talking about high CPUs, high GPUs, to be able to give you all that power for those users in your organization that really want to dive deep uh, and, and get the full experience of machine learning. Um, at the platform services layer, that's the, uh, the middle layer there, uh, we have SageMaker. We have other ones, but the focus one is SageMaker right now. Uh, it really allows you to focus on data exploration, model training, uh, and also model deployment in a single, easy to use uh, platform. 
And in the top layer, we have a series of uh, pre-trained application services that let you embed machine learning uh, directly into your own application with a single, simple API call. No training required. So very, very easy to get started. Amazon SageMaker um, is a fully managed machine learning service that provides three core capabilities. A hosted Jupyter Notebook, uh, environment allowing users to visually explore the data and interactively um, iterate through experimentations, building machine learning models, and testing them out. Very powerful feature to get started with machine learning when you have data scientists and even just you know, engineers that want to become data scientists to get started. Uh, the second component is a distributed training engine to quickly and efficiently train machine learning models on a lot of data. Right? Inside your notebook, you can train and you can play with a little bit of data. But in, with our distributed engine, you can actually train on a lot of data. And that's really where a lot of the power comes in. And then the, the third component is a serverless hosting environment to let you make predictions quickly right, without the hassle of infrastructure. Serverless is, is really key to get started very fast and not spend a lot of money as you're learning and as you're exploring and, and, and scaling your, uh, your application. So SageMaker comes pre-installed with uh, 14 of the most popular algorithms uh, and is pre-configured to run uh, MXNet and TensorFlow. Uh, but you can also bring your own algorithms and frameworks if you choose to do so. So going into a little bit more on, on SageMaker. So you can get started really easily with our pre-built notebooks. So you spin up the, no, uh, the the SageMaker notebook environment, and there's a bunch of pre-built notebooks there that you can play around and, and kind of learn. Uh, but you can also bring your own notebooks, you create your own using your own data, and start building models that really make sense for your business. Uh, once you're happy with your model design, then you can move to training with a lot of more data. SageMaker provides one-click training and hyperparameter optimization uh, capabilities, so that really means that training is much faster and easier to do it on the cloud. Um, so when the model is ready, uh, is ready to go, SageMaker provides a one-click deployment uh, to get the model really into the world and start using it. Uh, once the model is deployed, SageMaker provides fully managed hosting um, for that model with auto-scaling and the rest of the infrastructure capabilities that you need to launch predictive services at scale. So this takes you from experimentation, learning how to use the service, all the way up to production in a single platform without really having to change anything or deploy any other kind of infrastructure. So really powerful. So to kind of bring it all together, uh, AWS provides the, the broadest and deepest set of services and features than any other cloud provider out there. Uh, the AWS suite of services really help you move data into your data lake, store it, analyze it, and also act on it quickly. Start small, experiment, and scale as demand for your application grows paying only for the infrastructure and the resources that you use. All right, at this point, I'm going to hand off to Susanna to give you a use case of how uh, Autodesk is actually using all these services on AWS. All right, Go thank you, Roy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Susanna Vejraškova. You don't have to try to pronounce my full name. And um, I am an engineering manager at Autodesk. I uh, am in a group called um, Data and Automation Platforms. And um, I have a small team. We are very passionate about innovation and about using technology to solve the problems of our customers and of our other internal Autodesk teams. So about uh, three or four months ago, we have implemented one of our data science pipelines using AWS Glue and AWS SageMaker. And it was only about four months after SageMaker was released in last year's uh, AWS reInvent. So in the talk today, I'm going to share with you two things. I will share with you about the AWS Glue and SageMaker and how we have used these new services. Uh, but I will also share with you the overall like end-to-end -end, uh, picture of how Autodesk is using data from Salesforce and how we use AWS services to provide better insights into our customers' behavior. Um, so before we dive into the details of our use case, uh, let me ask you a question. How many of you know Autodesk? All right, I see a lot of hands up. Um, so um, many of you know Autodesk. Some of you might be even Autodesk customers. Um, Autodesk is a software company. Autodesk gives you the power to uh, make anything. So if you have ever driven a high-performance car, or if you have admired a skyscraper, or if you have watched a movie and you love the effects, 
chances are you have experienced something that uh, millions of our customers are doing using the Autodesk software. We have uh, over 200 million customers, we have over 8,000 employees, and we have over 100 products. And the Autodesk products range from construction and manufacturing, uh, media and entertainment, and uh, design um, collections. So there are three goals that Autodesk as a company is focusing on. The first goal is to complete the subscription transition. The second goal is to digitize the company. And the third goal is to reimagine the construction manufacturing and production. And the reason I'm sharing with you the overall Autodesk goals is because we wouldn't be able to achieve these goals um, if we are not able to engage with our customers in a way that they find every interaction with us valuable. So our big focus is on the engagement with our customers and providing them the value they need. Namely, there are three areas where we want to engage with our customers. First one is we want to provide um, delight our customers with the experiences that we provide them. Second one is um, we want to engage with our customers and provide them the right help at the right time when they need it. And the third one is uh, we want to create insights about our customers and also we want to provide insights for our customers. So really the goal or the opportunity that we have is to know our customers and empower those who interact with our customers with the information they need. Now, some of you who know about Autodesk, you might know that Autodesk is a very old company. Um, Autodesk has been in business for 35 years. So what does that mean? It means that we have a lot of, lot of legacy systems and a lot of legacy processes. Um, this leads to a couple of challenges. The first challenge is that our data is uh, dispersed in 25 different systems. We are a big customer of Salesforce. We have implemented the first Salesforce um, over nine years ago, but uh, we have data coming from our products. We have data coming from many other systems. So using data only from Salesforce wouldn't allow us to create the insights and analytics that we need to engage with our customers. The second challenge here, uh, let me ask you, do you have any data scientists or data analysts in the room? Awesome, I see a few. So I'm sure you will agree with me on this one. At Autodesk, our data science team, they want to be empowered to use the tools of their choice. Many of our data scientists like to work in R. So they want to work in R. Um, some might be uh, preferring to use Python or other tools. So they need access to the data and they need to be able to use the tool of their choice. And the third um, challenge that we have is um, our sales and customer success teams. So these people work in Salesforce most of the time. They spend 90% of their day in Salesforce. So we need to be able to provide them the analytics and the data they need at the place where they spend most time of the day, which is Salesforce. Like nobody from like sales teams want to go and write an SQL query to query a SQL table to get their insights. Um, so to overcome these challenges, um, there are three areas which I will talk about um, today. The first one is about the Autodesk data lake and how we bring the data from Salesforce and other systems into the data lake. The second one is how we use predictive analytics on top of the data. And the third part um, is about how we integrate the data back into Salesforce. And this is the fun part, so I hope you stick around until the end so that you can see how we integrate it back into Salesforce. So before we dive deep into the technical solution, um, what we really do, and this is like um, what we do at Autodesk, uh, we have uh, multiple um, models and analytics that we run on top of the data. But our ultimate goal is to merge the data from Salesforce and other systems to create high impact predictions, insight and recommendations, to optimize the engagement with our customers and to generate new business and uh, ultimately to predict the risk of churn of our customers. So in the whole customer lifecycle process, there are really two stages where the data science model focuses on. The first stage is the customer acquisition. So over there, we have models like um, the funnel optimization, like piracy analytics, or like product recommender. And these are really designed to uh, bring the new business to Autodesk. And the second area of the models is the customer success. So in this area, uh, we try to understand the whole customer journey from the point where they purchase the software until how they are using the software, 
how they are adopting the software until the point of they are renewing the software and they are like a recurring customer for us. So Salesforce provides us a lot of the data that we need and AWS provides us the tools we need to engage with our customers. Um, we have data uh, coming from Salesforce. We have data like uh, support cases, data about our customers, opportunities, renewals, uh, data about our partners coming from Salesforce. Then we have the other enterprise system. So we use Marketo as a different marketing system. We are using um, analytics, clicks from the websites, uh, details from the forums where the customers can go and ask questions um, about the products. And we have data from our Autodesk products. So uh, we can uh, we gather all the logs from the products, what features of the products the customers are using, how frequently, what times of the day are they using our products. So those are the three major data sources. And we ingest all the data into AWS S3, which we use as a storage. And we use different ingestion patterns based on the nature of the source system. So we use services like AWS Gloom, AWS Kinesis, or AWS Lambda to bring the data into AWS. The second part is on the predictive analytics um, in the green box on the slide. So we use um, Amazon EMR or we use Glue to do compute and transformation and ETL processing of the data. Uh, we use um, Athena, Redshift, or RDS to expose the data into tables so that our downstream users, business um, analysts, data analysts, data scientists can easily query the data. And uh, we, use, uh, we use Amazon SageMaker or we use uh, Python running on EMR to um, deploy and run the machine learning models. For our data analysts, same as with our data scientists, we want to give them the choice to use the tool that they prefer to use. So uh, they can query the data from S3 using ClickView, using Looker, using Tableau, or they can query directly using SQL. So they have the freedom to use whichever reporting tool they prefer to use. And uh, the fun part is the Salesforce integration. So uh, we used um, AWS Lambda to integrate some of the records back into Salesforce so that the sales representatives and the sales teams and the customer success teams can see the business score drivers inside Salesforce in the account and contact pages and so on. So um, let's dive a little bit more detail into each of these steps. So for the data ingestion, um, in terms of Salesforce specifically, we used AWS Glue to uh, pull the data from Salesforce and store it into AWS uh, S3 as a storage. In terms of um, our, so AWS, um, we basically consolidated data from 25 uh, systems. It um, offers a solution which is uh, serverless, it's scalable, it's reliable. We don't need to have a big uh, data engineering team which will keep configuring um, all the solutions because we use uh, some of the serverless tools like AWS Glue. And in terms of the customer chain prediction use case specifically, uh, we brought data from Salesforce. So we are looking at uh, the support cases that are open. We are looking at the account details and the details of how many products and what products each customer has. And we merge it with data related to websites, related to forums, if the customer is searching help somewhere on forums. And we merge it uh, with the data from the product usage because ultimately it's very important to understand how much the customers are using our product. The second step is the data processing. So um, for the data processing, we normalized and curated the data. We have data engineers who create uh, something called the um, enterprise data profiles, which allows for um, consistent use of the data. Everyone accessing the same tables, same view of a contact, they have same view of account, they have same view of the customer. Um, and um, it allows easy access for data analysts and data scientists via Athena. So in terms of the use case, we used AWS uh, S3 as the storage. We used Glue for the processing. We store the uh, temporary files again into S3, and we also store the final file into S3. And we used Glue, Glue Crawler to create the Athena table on, on top of the final ASV file. 
So the final ASV file in this case is uh, basically um, output of uh, over 20 different SQL queries, which joins the multiple data sources and creates one final file, which is used in the next step for the predictive analytics. So in this case, um, the data science team, they, they like to work in ARM, so they actually have developed their uh, machine learning model to score uh, the customers and the risk of churn in R. It's uh, deployed on Amazon EMR, and uh, they published the uh, scores into Redshift. So uh, in terms of the prediction use case to predict the customer churn, um, they retrain, they, they, they are two steps that they run with the model. First one is they retrain the model um, based on the newest data. And then they use the model to score the accounts or the customers, which are due to renew within the next 90 days. Now this is the fun part. So this is how we implemented the same model using some of the newest technologies like AWS Glue and SageMaker. So what we did is we took the same model which was already developed in R. And this is a great thing about SageMaker that it, it, it offers like the algorithms that Roy talked about, but it also gives you the freedom to use your already pre-built or custom built model in any tool of your choice like in R or Python and deploy it within SageMaker. Um, this still allows you to um, have and utilize some of the advantages of SageMaker, like uh, the serverless aspect or the scheduling and monitoring via CloudWatch. So to give you an example, before we deployed the model in SageMaker, in the previous solution, you also, you, you need your data scientists to develop the model, but there was also software engineers and uh, DevOps engineers who need to build and custom build the whole framework around the model. So you need to write code to trigger all the SQL scripts, to monitor the scripts, to see if any of the scripts fail, to trigger the model and to monitor how the model runs and to monitor how the model outputs the result and so on. And plus configure your settings on the EMR cluster. With SageMaker, we actually were able to rebuild the same pipeline using the same logic in two weeks using Glue and SageMaker because it was very easy to just take the model deployed in SageMaker and we don't have to worry about the scheduling and monitoring part. All right, so now the fun part, as I promised, uh, but I have even one fun, more fun, fun part coming after it. So the Salesforce integration, right? So we talked about it's great to develop a great machine learning model. Our data scientists have amazing models which produces great scores. But unless we are able to display the scores to the people who actually need them, which are our data, which are our sales representatives and customer success teams, the scores wouldn't be very useful. So um, we integrate the data from AWS back into Salesforce. Uh, you can see two options or two use cases how this is being done. The one in the bottom where the data is um, done as a batch prediction and it's uh, exposed via Redshift, we actually used Informatica to publish the data into Salesforce. In the um, second option up top, uh, we actually use a, uh, AWS Lambda, uh, which is um, a serverless function. It uh, takes the newly predicted scores and it uh, pushes them into the objects in Salesforce where you need them using the Salesforce Lightning APIs. In terms of the customer churn prediction use case, the model scores from one to five on each step of the customer journey. So there is score on the onboarding, on the adoption, and on the renewals, renewal part. And um, it produces the score and also the score drivers, um, which are available in the page in Salesforce, which I will show you in a minute. So uh, here you can see the end-to-end -end architecture of the entire flow that we just walked through. So there's one thing that I would like to highlight on this architecture, which we managed to accomplish using the, some of the AWS services like Glue and SageMaker. And um, you can see that this allows you to do a very clear cut between the data engineering work and the data science work. So the data engineers who can work on Glue and SageMaker and Athena, and the data scientists who can consume the data from Athena and work in uh, the tool of their choice to build their models. So basically to build an end-to-end -end pipeline, the only three skill set or the only three technical skill set that you need here is the data engineer, the data scientist, and AWS DevOps engineer to help with some of the deployments. 
Um, so some of the business value that Autodesk has seen uh, by uh, deploying uh, the different data science models uh, which I shared earlier is um, we have seen 3.6 times um, improvement in demand generation. Uh, the Autodesk had 10 million new billings based on the piracy analytics. Uh, we have gained visibility into the onboarding health and uh, we have accurate uh, visibility and uh, predictions of the risk of customer churn and of the renewal rates. So let's look how this view will look like in Salesforce. So uh, we talked about the customer churn prediction. We talked about there is a score driver which is from number one to five. So uh, based on the score driver now one to five, there is a risk bands which get um, which get populated. So you can see that in this particular renewal opportunity, this customer is at high risk of renewal. And uh, that's the orange box over there. And then you have the four different score drivers, which tell the sales representative more details of why it was scored as high risk. So in, in case of this particular customer, you can, for example, see that his uh, product usage or the product profile is positive. Uh, you can see that his uh, subscription engagement is uh, negative. So the sales representative has these details in front of them and they can optimize or prioritize what customers they reach out to. So they don't have to reach out to customers which are like highly likely to renew because they will renew anyways. They don't have to reach out to customers which are like extremely unlikely to renew because maybe no matter how hard they try, um, especially if it's like a small customer, they probably might not renew anyways. And they can really prioritize their time to focus, to work with the customers which are somewhere in the middle and turn them towards um, renewing our software and services. And here's one more view of a different um, predictive model which uh, is called a product recommender. So in this model, we basically suggest what other products the customer might uh, be interested in. And uh, the data science model is again built, uh, custom built, it runs on AWS, and the prediction scores are uh, pushed back into Salesforce for the customers, for the sales representatives to see. So in, the, in case of this, uh, you can see that this uh, account is very likely to uh, purchase additional product. And you can see, again, the score drivers why. And, um, you can see what are the additional products that they are very likely to, to purchase. All right, so some of the key takeaways. So for Autodesk, AWS and Salesforce provide uh, the necessary tools. Uh, Salesforce provides us the data about our customers and AWS provide us the technology to use the data to build models and to deploy them back and push the scores back into Salesforce. Um, the AWS machine learning services offer a great choice and flexibility. Uh, most of the tools are serverless, so uh, there is less work and effort needed on the engineering teams and on to build the whole infrastructure. And um, yeah, auto scaling is very important as well. So if we have more data, the serverless aspect uh, makes sure that our models and our loads will still run. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for um, paying attention and we have time. I think, I think we have a few more minutes for uh, Q&A. So just uh, before we wrap up, uh, please come see us uh, later on today, I think 1 p.m. Uh, for this other session. Also come visit us uh, at the booth. Uh, if you're at uh, Moscone South, uh, 1104 is our booth. Come check it out. If you have any questions, you want to see some of the, uh, the latest integrations that we have with Salesforce around data and other components, um, also Amazon Connect, which is our call center, and Alexa for Business, uh, come see us. Uh, if you have any questions, we have a few minutes to take some. Um, I think that mic in the middle is, uh, is open if you want to, unless you want to project your voice. I just wanted to check, like, uh, when you were writing the output back from uh, Amazon EMR to uh, the Salesforce Cloud, we are using Informatica. So which component and why? I mean, what exact functionality is missing in the current AWS stack? Um, so that solution we built about um, a y two years ago before AWS came with some of the new services. I think Lambda was released like a year and a half? A few, a couple of years ago, yeah. A couple of years ago as well. Uh, but there, there are different, um, yeah, there can be different reasons. 
which component of informatica are you using like are you using idq or like to write to the salesforce cloud when mm, i'm not sure of the details but uh, i can get back to you on that sure okay. yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can schedule the Lambda using CloudWatch. So you can schedule it um, either to run um, daily or every hour, or you can schedule it that whenever the model run finishes, it triggers the Lambda function, which gets the data and then uh, publishes the data into Salesforce. So there's like few options. So in your case, you use more of a scheduled option? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the other question is, Primarily, I totally get this as an engineering background, so I totally understand this is a better way to go. But from a business standpoint, how are you able to convince the business on how do you do this as a science time? Like, how do you do this model outside of mm -hmm. the yeah. and do it this way? Like, was it a tough process for you? Was it easy? So, um, this, so our data science team has built the model already over maybe over one year ago, maybe two years ago. So it was actually before Einstein was there. Uh, so at that time, it was the best solution that we had provided to our business. But, um, sir, do you want to add anything? So I think we're with the same team as that. So the other reason what we had is that like, not all of our data is in Salesforce, so we have to empower Einstein if he has to be in Salesforce. So if you look at the, the ecosystem of uh, stuff we have on our stage, most of the data doesn't make it to so far as we see it now. Since uh, there's going to be a lot of data, we can rely on AWS to be that uh, place where we collect the data and then have our machine learning uh, programs run on there. If I, if I can add just one more point, I think, Susanna, during, during your session, you also talked about the fact that it took you, you know, about two weeks to build this whole thing. So it's, it's a pretty low risk for the business. So even if they did want to take that, that risk and say, sure, go ahead, go try it, right? It's a very small risk, very low cost, um, you know, option. So even if it doesn't work out, right, it, it's still not a big, not a big issue. Hmm. Yeah, I go guess, ahead. wow, this is pretty hot, Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, a lot of these services, uh, you know, or a lot of these integrations have been built out, you know, in, in years prior. And I'm curious how this, like, announcement of the partnership affects, or like, you know, what the, what the goal is. I mean, since these partnerships already exist, or, or since these integrations already existed, is the focus really to just kind of standardize the models for certain business processes and, and use cases, or like, what, what, what is the goal? Or how, how does it change moving forward? Was I, I don't know if there's a question for me or for Zuzana. Are you talking about the, the integrations uh, between AWS and Salesforce? Yeah. I'm talking more specific to the... Now, it, you guys have kind of announced this, you know, like through this, uh, there, I think there was a blog post, you know, published two days yes, ago. Yes, that's right. Yeah. A couple days ago. Talking about the, yeah, yeah. effectively, what, what is it? What's going to change aside from these, like, kind of standard uh, services that we're already using for our integrations? Yeah, uh, that's a great, great question, right? So um, the integration really talks about two main things, right? The connection between the AWS cloud and the Salesforce cloud, just giving you an option to do it privately, securely, uh, in a managed way. And then the other component is around data integration. So just being more uh, prescriptive with how we help customers get it out of Salesforce, do some work on it on the AWS cloud, and then push the data back in. Okay. So today, like Susanna showed, there's a number of different ways to do it. There's APIs, there's JDBC connections, there's a bunch of different ways. Yeah. So we're just trying to kind of streamline the whole process and give you a prescriptive uh, process to do it so you don't have to you know, be an expert at, at doing all this stuff. It's an easier process. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, it's possible to build uh, custom models in R, et cetera and integrate them with this framework. Now, is there any, uh, any specific, stat I mean, technique selection uh, component also there? I mean, or is it absolutely generic? That means we can build any model, which is either a logistic regression model mm -hmm. or some other model, and just integrate that into this piece. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the process that we normally follow for this integration? Yeah, so um, in this case, the model was already built in R. The data science team built a model prior to SageMaker was announced. So we, we use the same model um, and then we just run the model within SageMaker. So you can install all the R libraries within SageMaker and I think uh, SageMaker has the R kernel as well, yeah. which is already pre-built with all the R libraries. 
So um, it was very easy to do it. I would say the advantage is that SageMaker is uh, serverless, so you don't have to worry about the infrastructure around it. So in the past, the data science team have to build all their monitoring around the model, and they need to configure the EMR cluster because the R model was running in EMR, but in SageMaker it was like easier. So we, I did not do, let's say, changes to the model. I just took the model and put it in SageMaker. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, Amazon EMR is basically our Hadoop managed environment, right? So you can run any kind of machine learning that you want to run on it, but it requires a lot more management on your side. Where SageMaker gives you, I think, 14 pre-installed um, algorithms, right? XGBoost, linear regression, logistic regression, etc. You can just click a button, put your parameters in, and run. But if you did want to bring your own model, right, whether it's R, it can also be TensorFlow or some other model that you've custom built, you can actually bring it on a Docker container registered with um, the, the Amazon Elastic uh, Container Service, and then you can just launch it. You can say, I want to launch it on 10 different nodes uh, of this size, and then we'll just launch that model on those nodes, pass them the parameters, and just do the training for you. Okay, and, and there is also an inbuilt uh, monitoring mechanism as well, which you mentioned, right? I mean, for yeah. different models post-implementation, we are going to track the yep. outcome and performance of these models as well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, we, we definitely expose all that information back out into CloudWatch, which is our monitoring sort of auditing service. Um, so you can see whatever you print out of your model process, you can see it there. Uh, we also have hyperparameter um, optimization. So you can define your hyperparameters, the range of values of what you want to you test, and then we'll just execute that on a distributed environment and just iterate through those parameters until we find the best set of hyperparameters for your model. Any other questions? No? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.